In this video, I'm focusing on what you should look for in a full face helmet. Obviously, a full face helmet covers your whole face, most of your head, and will give you better protection than an open face helmet. It stands to reason that if more of your head is covered, you're gonna be better protected. If you're looking for information on open face helmets, don't necessarily go away. Some of what I have to say today will impact you. There are basically seven categories that most riders look for in a helmet. They are concerned about safety, comfort, material, noise, features, style, and for most of us, price. But while I don't wanna make this all about safety, for many, it is an important consideration when buying a helmet. So I will touch on the different standards first before hitting the other considerations when we come to buy helmets. If safety is not for you, then by all means fast forward this section. But before you do, did you know your helmet might be useless in the cold? This is a long and comprehensive video. It's unsponsored and it contains my own views and the views of the people that I have used for research to find out about helmets and helmet design and how it affects us. I've been riding both off-road and on-road for 45 years. I've had my fair share of accidents, including one just a few weeks ago, as some of you may know. What this video isn't is a particular product recommendation. That's up to you. It's not a review of any one helmet, although I will discuss some particular helmets that I have experience with to illustrate some points. Canada is quite flexible in its tolerance for many different certifications on helmets and helmet standards, as opposed to the US, where officially you have to conform to one standard, the DOT. In Europe, you have to wear a helmet with an ECE rating on it. That's the law. Many helmets will carry more than one sticker. This one, for instance, this one is capable of it. So is this one, this one as well but sometimes they won't show all of those stickers. If you buy your HJC Arfa 91 in the States, then this will have a DOT sticker on it. If you buy it in Europe, it'll have an EC2206 sticker on it as of 2024. Last year, that would have been an EC2205 sticker. What does that all mean? There are so many different standards out there. Many of you will not have known what the heck I was talking about right then. And it can be confusing when it comes to understanding them, which is best and what they mean, how they test and what's right for you. Even scientists and technicians cannot agree exactly on which one works best. I will try to help you out with that. Put simply, according to some authorities, the most common consensus is that Sharp, Snell, and ECE, the European rating system, are superior to DOT, and the ECE has a slight edge over Snell. However, that is a generalization as helmets are certified in different ways. In short, the latest ECE certified helmets, 2206, is considered to be the best benchmark right now. The emphasis and criteria for all the testing by these different organizations is really different. The list of what they test is endless. Impact on different surfaces and shaped surfaces, penetration, impact attenuation, retention, that's the chin strap, accessories, chin bar, visor ballistics, visor clarity, field of vision, and even water penetration, if you can believe it or not. Some test UV effects and chemicals on the helmets. So if you're thinking about putting stickers on your helmets, you might be concerned about that. Some will test helmets to temperatures down to minus 20 degrees Celsius, as materials can fail in different ways at different temperatures. Briefly and in a nutshell, even if the DOT standard were the best in the world, and it's not, by the way, the government relies on manufacturers to self-certify that their helmets meet the standard, conducting very little random testing, sometimes almost none themselves. My advice is make sure that your helmet has an ECE sticker on it or a Snell sticker as well as a DOT one, and then you know you're getting a great helmet. Not that DOT is a poor standard. It's just not perhaps quite as comprehensive and reliable as the others, and we'll see why in a second. The ECE motorcycle helmet standards involve a wider array of tests than the DOT do. 
An advantage of the ECE test is that they test for more real-life environmental factors than the dot tests. In fact, they'll take helmets down to minus 20, although what you're doing out in minus 20, I don't know, unless it, perhaps you're in a ski -doo or something. But your helmet, if you get into an accident, will react in a very different way in that temperature. Things get brittle. They don't give as much. They test more helmets of different sizes and they test all accessories too, including visor quality, penetration resistance, UV protection, integrated comms, etc, etc, etc. Anything that comes on your helmet is tested. One unique thing about ECE is they require what's called batch testing. Batch testing of helmets before those helmets are allowed out of the factory and to stores. This is to make sure that the helmet's quality remains the same instead of decreasing after the first batch. Every batch of helmet that is made has to be tested in Europe before they're released. So if Scorpion make a batch of these helmets, they send 33 away, they're tested. The next batch of these helmets they make, they have to send another 33 away. There's no reducing the quality of your helmets after you've passed the tests. It's a great system. Here's another great system, SHARP. SHARP is funded by the UK government. It's the only standard that allows us to compare helmets directly based on a five-star rating scheme and a color-coded impact resistance color code. SHARP helmets are color-coded from green, which is the best, through yellow, orange, brown, red, and black, which is the worst. Prior to undergoing SHARP tests, all motorcycle helmets must have already cleared the ECE 2206. Now that is going to be one of the best helmets you can get. It's an EC 2206, and then SHARP have tested it themselves, given it stars out of five and a color coding. Why is that helpful? Well, when you get to choosing a helmet and say they've got the features that you want, the colors that you want, the style that you want, they're both ECE 2206. You're really not sure which one to get. They cost roughly the same amount. Go to the Sharp website. Which one has got more stars? Which one has got the better color? Is it yellow? Is it orange? Is it brown? Is it red? Is it black? That could be the tipping point for you. Finally, there is Snell, named after Pete Snell, a Californian I believe racer, way back. One of the strongest aspects of Snell certification, and this helmet has a Snell certification on it, is their practice of purchasing helmets from the marketplace and testing them in their own laboratory. They don't ask manufacturers, they just go out and buy their own at random and test them. The Snell standard tests are far more rigorous than the dot tests. Although Snell tests do not influence what is legal, legally permissible in the States, that is, you can't just buy a Snell helmet in the States and wear it. It must also have a dot sticker. Any helmet that has a dot sticker and then a Snell sticker on top of it is a darn good helmet, just like if it has the ECE and then it's rated by Snell and it gets a five star. That is a darn good helmet. Finally, a Snell certified helmet ensures the most impact absorption and often has the thickest foam layers inside it to back it up. In contrast though, ECE operates under the assumption that impact absorption must be balanced with weight. The idea is that a lighter helmet has less inertia in a crash, which is less strain on your neck and back. As far as research can tell, ECE seem to have the edge on this, that weight is more important than thickness of padding. And FIM, who oversee racers, seem to agree with uh, ECE. Personally, because I ride in Canada and the States, I buy ECE helmets that are also dot rated. That is, if you buy this HJC Alpha 91 in Europe, it will have an ECE 2206 sticker on it now. If you buy this in North America, it will come with a dot sticker. That means it passes both rating systems, in which case it's a universal helmet that you can use on both of those continents. Once I've got my ECE and dot helmet, I then use the Sharp website to compare my helmets. Now Sharp have been a little lazy in the past few years and they're not testing quite as many helmets as they used to. So it may be that the latest helmets are not on there yet or may never get there. I'm not sure where Sharp is going, but they have a huge inventory for you to look at already. Chances are, if you're wearing a helmet now, it may well be on there.
Okay, that was safety. The second part of this section was materials. I'm sorry that went on so long, but let's get on to materials. It may be a little more interesting. As a general rule, and taking into account normal use, a helmet made with a thermoplastic or polycarbonate resins tends to last in full working order for about five years, like this polycarb scorpion. Meanwhile, other helmets, fiberglass, carbon, carbon, will tend to last or stretch their life up to about nine or 10 years. Although you need to keep an eye on the wear and tear inside and out. You need to make sure also that you've not dropped them or crashed in them. Carbon fiber is both light and hard to beat as a helmet shell material because of its extremely high tensile strength, which is at least 25 times stronger than fiberglass. Surprisingly, a full carbon fiber shell helmet still weighs roughly 12 ounces less than an equivalent fiberglass one of the same size. This is more comfortable for your neck. It can be noisy though. But the true magic of carbon fiber lies in its inherent ability to dissipate impacts by distributing the energy throughout the length of a single strand and onto all the adjacent strands of the entire weave, which means you don't get point loads. If something or you hit the ground in one place, that impact is spread throughout the whole weave. Carbon fiber is the best at doing this by far. The downside of carbon fiber is it can be expensive, but not as expensive as the next material. Kevlar is an expensive fiber that has good tensile strength, not as good as carbon fiber. While weaker than carbon, it is much stronger than fiberglass. And it can be used to reinforce fiberglass helmet shells woven in as a multi-composite shell. Additionally, the material has a high heat abrasion and cut resistance, very high, offering better sliding protection in a helmet than any other fiber. However, it is never used as a standalone shell material because it would be astronomically expensive. Fiberglass. Fiberglass is a composite material containing glass fibers held together by a polymer matrix, typically epoxy or polyester. While it is heavier and nowhere near as strong as carbon fiber or Kevlar, it is more elastic than both of them, flexing to absorb impacts without breaking apart. This can actually in some situations be an advantage. It's easier to process than carbon fiber and more protective than polycarbonates. It's the go-to material for affordable mid-priced helmets. In fact, there are some out there that say a fiberglass based helmet with Kevlar and carbon composite fibers in it is actually the best of all worlds. They might be slightly cheaper, Often they are slightly cheaper than a pure carbon helmet. Polycarbonate. Polycarbonate is a high tech thermoplastic. It provides impressive impact resistance while it guards against penetration. Its shock absorbing ability does not match laminated shells like fiberglass or carbon fiber. It also degrades with water. So water and UV light degrades thermoplastic. You have five years. If you're lucky enough never to ridden in the rain, then you've been riding in the sun. You just can't get around it, folks. Water and sunlight degrades this material to a point that it is no longer considered safe after five years and you should replace your helmet. This one is just about due. If this is probably the last polycarb helmet I'll buy, not necessarily because of that fact, the environmental factors on it, more that it is heavy. Inside each of these helmets, we have EPS, it's expanded polystyrene, and they're foam liners. The best helmets uh, have a combination of hard foam and softer foams. The cheaper helmets will have a medium foam, no hard, no soft. The hard is usually closer to the shell on the more expensive helmets, and then the softer is closer to the liner on the inside. You want to look for that multi-dense foam, the hard, the medium, and the soft, it gives the best protection. Strictly hard, strictly medium, or strictly soft is not going to do as well. Sticking with materials and safety, one of the last things you have to look at is the helmet retention mechanism. Now this helmet here, the Scorpion, okay, uh, it comes with a double D, if I can pull that round here. It comes with a double D mechanism. It's familiar to most of us. We will thread this through here and it locks really tightly. Double D is the preferred uh, chin strap mechanism by most racing organizations. In fact, FIM will not accept anything else. It is 
probably the most fail safe out of all of them. There are also magnetic chin straps. I don't know, but uh, my personal preference is not to rely on that. And then there are what we have in here, uh, which is the ratchet affair. So the ratchet affair is you would take your metal insert, your male end, and you'll slip it in to the female end. And it'll ratchet in. To release it, you'll pull down on the strap and out it comes. Pretty effective. Doesn't quite give you the same adjustability as a double D because you've got ratchets and you'll snap into a certain degree and then to another one. There's no space between those ratchets. So often it works really well. I don't find a problem with them, but my preference is actually double D if I can get it. Where have I heard that before? Finally, face shields. There are two basic types, polycarbonate and acrylic. Acrylic tends to be cheaper, scratches more, is sometimes not UV impregnated, and is not quite as ballistically strong. If you can, go for polycarbonate face shields. Helmets come in different size and shapes. Depending on your head, you should figure out what your head shape is, whether it's oval, whether it's round, whether it's an intermediate oval. There are many different categories out there. When you've found out what your head shape is, many manufacturers will tell you what their helmet is best geared for. It's an intermediate oval. It's for a round head. Some of them, some of the higher quality ones, will have aftermarket padding or inserts that can actually change the shape of the helmet. You need to look into that on your own. Within that, many manufacturers offer different shell sizes such that the size small may get a smaller shell than a medium, which might be sold with a smaller shell than a large. Some companies may only offer two shell sizes, a small and a large, and if you're medium, well then you're going to have a little less padding for a small or a more padding if you get the large one. They'll give you a shell, probably be the small one, and they'll pad it less. If you're an uh, extra large, you're probably going to get less padding in the large shell. This isn't ideal. What you want to look for is a helmet manufacturer that produces more shell sizes. So two is okay. One is a helmet I wouldn't bother getting. Three and four is better. The more shell sizes a model has, the more customizable it may be and the better it may fit and conform to your head shape. I always pick the tightest helmet I can wear comfortably for 15 minutes without feeling any pressure points or in any particular part of my face or head. But remember, the best helmet is the one you're going to wear because it's comfortable. Noise isn't too much of an issue if you wear earplugs or sit behind a windshield, but even then, some helmets are so loud that using a comm or even hearing your custom can, or listening to music will be almost impossible. Nice to have a helmet that's innately quieter and allows you to use an intercom or just focus on the experience rather than tire whine or wind noise or helmet whistle. It's hard to know if a helmet will actually be quiet until you ride with it, but there are some clues. If the helmet has a peak or an external comm, or even a poorly sealing visor. Now this one seals really well in this, and you can actually snap your finger up putting it in there. That, you could hear that. It seals really well. If, like this HJC R491, the helmet has a tight fitting collar around the base of the helmet, fits snugly, has closable vents, well then it may be quieter. The less vents, the quieter it will actually be. If the helmet is carbon, like these two are, it will be noisier than the equivalent helmets in fiberglass or composite fiber. It's just the way it is. Generally, all things being equal, the less protuberances on a helmet, the smaller the seams and the fewer the seams on a helmet, the quieter it will be. However, just to contradict myself about seams, this is a modular helmet. If I pull up on the red here, you'll see it opens right up. I can close it down again. This has more seams on it. You would expect it to be noisier than this guy, which is a solid full face helmet. However, the reverse is actually true. This is an extremely noisy helmet, and this is an extremely quiet helmet. This helmet, as you have noticed before, has a very close chin padding and neck padding around the bottom there. This one does not have chin padding anywhere near as close and is much more open at the front, letting much more noise in. 
The quietest helmet is a hard thing to find unless you're given permission to ride with helmets before you buy them, and that will never happen. So one place you can go is the Champion Helmets YouTube channel, which is uh, a very good channel as far as finding out how quiet helmets are. They do a control test where they test the helmet on the same bike, behind the same screen, at the same speeds, and they do that with all sorts of different helmets. It turns out the quietest helmet they've ever tested was not the legendary and expensive brands from Arai, Shuei, or even the mighty Shoeberth. It was this one, the composite fiber version of this one, the HJ Arfa 91. This one is the second quietest helmet they've ever tested, which tells me it's the design of the helmet as much as it is the material they've made it of. Carbon is always louder than composite fiberglass, Kevlar and carbon, and this one being carbon will of course be louder than the HJC R for 91. Features, okay, down to the nitty gritty. Features, helmets, full face helmets come with all sorts of different features and which features are right for you is up to you. There are certain ones that I love, but I will talk about many of the different ones. First of all, removable or adjustable peaks. This peak is removable. I can unscrew two screws on the sides here and they've got a simple slot for a coin and I can take this peak off which quiets the helmet quite a bit. Makes it look fairly sporty as well actually. So it goes from being what looks like an ADV helmet almost to what looks like a racing helmet. They can be well-designed peaks. They'll let air flow through them like this one does. It's got a big space here without ripping your head off. Unless, of course, you turn your head sideways and you will notice no matter what peak you've got, you will notice quite a bit of pull. Some consider these a novelty, but I can tell you from experience, these saved me more than once, literally saved my hide more than once, riding to work when the sun was on the horizon after a wet rainfall and I couldn't see a thing, the glare was intense. By dipping this forward and casting a slight shadow over a small strip of the visor, I was able to see cars in front of me and where I was going. It was a lifesaver. So don't scoff at them next time you see one of these coming past you. I haven't got one on my latest helmets, but I now have more options not to ride first thing in the morning. The accessory, I really enjoy the most, but I don't have in all my helmets as an internal sun visor. The convenience of having the ability to manage brightness for me is vital. Riding on dim days, dawn, dusk, or even at night, it's a hassle to carry, replace, and store visors. So if I'm riding along on this guy and I want to ride at night, I've got to take this visor off or ride with it open, which is worse. And you can change the um, darkness or the tint on the internal sun visor on many different ones. This uh, Scorpion, for instance, has an internal sun visor. I'll pull this visor up so that you can see that better. If memory serves me correctly, it's there. And I can flick it forward and backwards. Like I say, they come in different shades. This came with a lighter one and I bought a dark, darker one and put it in. Some internal sun visors can be adjusted. As I push this down, there is a mechanism for me to be able to make sure that comes down lower. The HJC R 91 also has an internal sun visor and like the Scorpion, it has a solid mechanism with no spring. That means as I push forward, it goes up. As I pull back, it comes down. There's no spring loading. I'm not releasing a catch and having a spring fire it down. I'm actually driving it up and driving it down. This is very important. I have another HJC. I think it's an IS-21. Uh, it's my wife's helmet. It is spring loaded. And as they wear, they tend not to go up all the way or come down all the way without a little bit of help from your hand. So just a piece of advice about making sure that if you get an internal sun visor, make sure you get one that is directly driven with a loud thunk and not spring driven. Another feature of helmets is the venting, the airflow inside the helmet. Some work well, and some don't in my experience. This tends to be hit or miss and is down to several things. One is the unseen, unless you rip the innards out and take a look. It's how effective the design of the air channels inside the helmet is. You can have a honking big intake on the helmet, something huge at the front, but if the internal air channels aren't well designed or they're poorly designed, it's, and there's no rear exhaust venting, then the forward facing vents do very little to actually get air flowing through the helmet. Rear venting 
if I take a look, if I turn my helmets around, you'll see the different methods they have of venting at the rear. We'll talk about the front vents in a minute, but without a rear vent in a helmet, again, the airflow is going to be static. So turning these helmets around, you'll see some differences, starting with this one, the next Saltflax helmet. It has no rear vent. This one doesn't really need it. It's so open around the column that the vent at the front is not really that functional. It allows air in, but most of the air gets in under here. It's a retro helmet and kind of designed to look old school, so I completely understand that. It's super comfortable, actually, and doesn't seldom overheats because there's so much of that airflow. Together with that, though, it is quite noisy. Uh, therefore, I wear a collar around it, and that tends to inhibit the airflow in it. This little vent at the front does a little, but because there's no real exhaust, once I block that channel up for the air to get out, it's not effective at running air around it. This helmet, as you can see, has a vent at the back. I can open and close it. If I open it, then all of the forward vents start to channel air through it really effectively. This one has just a static vent. It's always open and it's right here. It's an exhaust vent. And this one has the same thing. You can see some grills back here. If I lift it up, you'll see some silver grills. Coming to the front, the necks carbon helmet here has a vent that's partially covered up with a chin mount for a helmet. It's not that effective anyway, so I don't really care too much about it. This has a whole plethora of vents. It's got the eyebrow vents, which I can open like so. Okay, it's got the top vent. I can slide it forward or open it by sliding it backwards. And it's got this chin vent, which can be open in two stages. It lets a lot of air in if I want it to do that. This one, if I don't open that rear vent, then of course those front vents aren't gonna do a lot. This one, again, very similar, has a rather large vent at the front. I can slide it up and down. And then of course I've got this top vent here will let air in as well. And the exhaust vent is always open, so air is always flowing through this. I found this to be a very comfortable helmet in that respect. This one has a passive rear vent. That means, uh, as I showed you before, it's always open and at the front, I've got, again, two detentes, I can open this up. And this is one of these helmets that does not really vent that well. It's a very tight fitting helmet and I would guess that the channels inside are not really well built. There are two little sort of above eyebrow vents here and I never really feel much in the way of cooling going on in here, actually. It does a good job of keeping its visor uh, clear, which is another job for vents. If I tilt it forward, you can see that there is a little grill um, just on just above the chin guard right about here if you take a look at it you'll see a grill there that is to directly flow air up over the visor and to make sure that the visor stays fog free it's hard to test how effective vents are without riding in them the best thing you can do is get online reviews of other users the h this hjc r 91 has extremely good reviews on its venting uh, the scorpion is moderately effective uh, this one, despite the vents, is poor, and I would say it's no better than this one that hardly has any vents in it. But however, when you're stationary in traffic, or if your system doesn't work that well, or it's a very humid day, uh, it's wet outside, then you may need to go to a pin lock. And then something else you need to look at is, is your visor pin lock ready? Now you can tell the uh, Arfa is. It's got these two pins either side here. Okay, and so you can see that that is a pin lock ready helmet. Okay, these other helmets also have a type of pin lock inside them, but it's a sticky pin lock that basically uh, sticks on the inside of the visor and it creates like a double glazing, like all pin lock does. So this is the one that comes with the HJC Arfa. Um, Next will send you one with uh, most of their helmets as well, being a high quality company. They will send you one of the sticky ones that goes inside. So my new version of this uh, Salt Flats helmet has uh, a new visor, uh, two visors actually, and a couple of pin locks that I can put inside them to keep them fog free. I think next know that the venting on this isn't awesome and you kind of need that with it. So I don't ride anywhere without pin lock. It just helps so much. Comms. More and more helmets being put out there come with spaces for integrated comms. The comms can be hidden inside the helmet and they don't really cause excessive wind noise or drag on you. And the comm bits and parts, some of it goes in here and some of it 
is screwed in under here and it's out of sight, out of mind. If it comes with an integrated comm, you don't have to use it. You can mount a different comm on the outside. The HJC Smart System is in fact a Senna comm system. They're pretty good systems. If you're a Cardo freak, then maybe this isn't the helmet for you. Lastly on my list, for features is modular helmets. Anytime a shell is broken into components like this is, they are going to be weaker than a solid shell. And as I contest, some of them will be louder than a solid shell. This one, for instance, will be slightly louder than a different Scorpion, which doesn't have it. This does a very good job through a lot of engineering. It's an expensive helmet. In order to make it that quiet, this is very expensive. If you go for a cheaper modular helmet, you are going to get more noise. What you really need to look for, though, is if you are intending to ride with this up on extremely hot days, okay, which you can do on some helmets, then you need to make sure that it is PJ certified. Now this one actually comes with a lock on the side. I would move this lock up and now it clips and locks this chin bar in the up position and I could ride this like a jet helmet. So this one is PJ certified to ride like that. This one though is not. So if I ride with this up, the integrity of the rest of the shell is compromised in an accident. The integrity of this shell is not compromised by the chin bar being up. Of course, if you do ride this up, then you are exposing your face to damage. That is entirely your choice. So this kind of has the best of both worlds if you like. It can be a full face or it can be an open face helmet. If it's PJ certified, it should lift up in such a way that as it comes up, so this juts out and stops air being able to get in underneath here. So you're not gonna get dragged back. It really reduces the pull on. If in those rare occasions I want to ride with it up, I know that the integrity of the helmet, the rest of the helmet is still good. And I also know that it's not gonna drag my head off when I'm riding with it. So designs of helmets are very different, but they also come in very different styles. So many styles. This would be your typical sport or racing helmet. And if you take a look, what makes this a sport or, or sporty racing sort of helmet is that they are designed for riding in a tucked position, low down, hunched forward. And you'll see that the visor port is sloped back so that you can wear it like this and see forward. And you're not having the big brow of the helmet come down over your eyes. Also, it's cut high at the back so that you can tuck. And as you tuck, your back bends and it may push the collar up. So you want that space back here as well. Moving on to touring helmets, here's your HJC R491, a typical touring helmet. I include modular helmets here. They're designed for semi-upright riding styles, not hunched forward, with a small amount of forward cant. But you can see that it has some adjustment for forward cant to it, but it's not cut anywhere near as high at the back. Okay, so sport bike riding may be a chore in these if you're, and your jacket may push them forward every time you hunch. Their great advantage is they're the best of both worlds. They're light, they're aerodynamic like these guys, but they're packed with more features. This has no internal sun visor, although you might be able to get them on more modern ones. Okay, it's very quiet. Um, it's more comfortable than this helmet to wear, and they come uh, in, let's say, more conservative helmet colors, uh, which may appeal to some people as well. ADV helmets like this Scorpion AT950 and uh, the subsequent updated model they've got out now, they're designed for very upright riding styles. Uh, they may have a removable or adjustable peak. This one's removable, not adjustable. And they generally look like uh, more like a pure dirt bike helmet. They may have a wide viewport to facilitate using dirt bike like goggles in here so you can raise the visor and have your dirt bike goggles in there. They can be more noisy than the pure touring helmets for sure and they'll certainly be heavier but they can, they can double as an off-road capable helmet as well as an on-road helmet. So this one I can, this is designed to be able to get those goggles in there. I can run the goggles around the back here and you'll notice on the back of this it has a lip here to keep the strap for the goggles down. So this would be your typical ADV type adventure helmet that you might wear on your GS, your Vstrom, your uh, 1290 Adventure, any of those bikes uh, you would look pretty good in. 
you'll notice the color on this. It used to be KTM uh, red or orange. It's gone more of a salmon pink now, which tells me the UV light has done its work on this polycarb shell. Finally, there's the more retro type of helmet, a slightly rounder style, reminiscence of the 70s and earlier, sort of more conservative styles. This, this used to be considered flashy in the 60s and 70s, just the two-tone here with stripes on it. I just like the style of this helmet. This is super comfortable to wear. You don't have to make a compromise when you get a retro helmet. The quality of this helmet is really, really nicely made. I mean, you can see inside it here what it looks like with that checkerboard pattern. Um, it's really nicely made. There's suede inside there. It's a gorgeous helmet and it's the lightest of all my helmets, about 1250. So even though it's a retro style helmet, this is full carbon and uh, a, a really, really nice helmet. And that's it. If you've stuck around this long, thank you very much. I hope you got something out of this video. If you did, please like it and subscribe and even check out my other videos on bike reviews, helmet reviews, gear reviews, just good old fashioned vlogs, any of them. Thanks very much. For more information on helmets, check out the notes below the video for some of those links I talked about in here. This is the Blue Marble Rider, out. Once again, thanks for watching everyone. If this is the first time you've watched, please consider subscribing. I do motorcycle reviews, motorcycle related product reviews, off-road and on-road vlogs as well as tours. Even though I'm not the most diligent poster, don't forget to follow me on social media. That's Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. And to like, and especially, I'm begging you here folks, subscribe. And don't forget to click the bell so that you're notified whenever I release a video. This is the Blue Marble Rider, out.